I get to take a break and I'm going to turn you over to two fine gentlemen, uh, Ryan Ford, Griffin Dunham. Ryan Ford has only ever done real estate. He's your compliance broker, uh, Nebraska State University or University of Nebraska, excuse me. Um, played football for two years, got hurt, was a star cornerback, was really going to make a pro football career. Right. Right, right, right. <laughs> you have you had aspirations, you did. Uh, and then got hurt, got injured, so wound up getting his real estate license and has had a real estate license and been actively selling real estate since he was a sophomore in college. Uh, he's now 48 and, <laughs> and still selling real estate, so he's not that old. I'm just kidding. Um, I think in my position, though, I do count dog years, so probably. Yeah, probably yeah that works. That. Okay, so dog years, yeah. <laughs> He's the compliance broker for Benchmark, former principal broker as well, has seen, has probably forgotten more about real estate contracts than most agents have ever seen. So when Ryan speaks, you want to listen, and they're going to talk to you today about the fraudulent activity that's going on. Now, Griffin Dunham is an attorney, so you have to call him Esquire. Um, has a law degree, of course, uh, former JAG officer, I believe in the Air Force, um, and then in the private practice in bankruptcy and business law and moved over into title law a number of years ago, but still operates and then participates in a law firm here in Nashville as well. Uh, Griffin has actually, he will never tell you this, but I'll tell you the caliber of the knowledge base here. Griffin has actually argued and won cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. And he is one of six attorneys uh, on the, the staff at Momentum Title and my, and my partner in that business and has just a wealth of resource of knowledge uh, to support our principal brokers and the information that they feed back to you. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. I will stop my uh, stop my screen share and let you guys share your screen. So kick it off there, Ryan Griffin, whoever wants to go first. Griffin's going to start us. Okay. Just a second here. I'm just bragging about how uh, high quality you are, and now you can. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm trying here. Uh, there you go. We see Zoom screen, so share the other screen. Well, it was working just a second ago. I guess, I'm man, we sure. even tested this. Yeah, we did test it. I'm not sure what. It's minimize I'm that. Stop, maybe, maybe. I'm going to stop the share. And... Yeah. Okay, so minimize your Zoom screen and then do share again, and it should. Come yeah, right there's in. only one thing. There we go. Wire fraud. There we go. Well, it took a little second. It took a little longer than I was hoping for. Apologize for that. Ryan and I even tested it early this morning. I, I'm Griffin Dunham. Thanks you very much for the intro, Philip. Very, um, I, I think that uh, the last 25 years or so have been a good learning experience in real estate law for both myself and Chris Corvo is the other owner of Momentum Title. He's on here too. He's on here mainly in case that in the chat there are difficult questions I can easily and seamlessly just defer to him and then make sure that those answers are provided. He, he's been started in Florida Again, many decades of doing title work. So there's nothing we haven't seen and look forward to hopefully working with everybody in here. Uh, I did, I have to apologize. I was wearing a nice jacket and a nice tie, but evidently despite being on this planet for 45 years, I still haven't mastered the ability to both eat and drink. So it unfortunately had to pivot to just the shirt only. But uh, today's presentation is one that is it the most fun topic to talk about? Probably not. Is it one of the most important topics to talk about? I think so. I think so. It's because on our end, on the title side, we see fraud on a daily basis, literally on a daily basis. And for those agents that don't see it on a daily basis, it's because simply there's not the same volume of, of uh, different matters being presented that we happen to see coming from all the different 300 plus closings a month that we do. And people are losing money every single day on this. And it's not just title companies. Uh, brokerages are losing money. Insurance companies are losing money. Title companies are losing money. 
seems like the only people who aren't losing the money are the people who have committed the fraud because they're nowhere to be found. And if they are found, they don't have anything to their name. And so it is important topic for us to make sure that everybody is aware of the different schemes, the different scams that are out there because they're getting better. Uh, several years ago, it seemed as though it was easy to spot a bogus text message or a bogus email. And nowadays it's much more difficult because people have improved their ability to not only email fish, but they've improved their ability to learn people's names and contact numbers in a way to try to mimic who they are, imitate who they are, and really send messages and emails to people that seem as though they're coming from a trusted account. So I think that the goal, the number one goal, at least on my end, I have two goals. One is to educate, make sure you're aware of what the different schemes are that are out there, because that education is then powerful when you're speaking with your clients. One of the most important things that really any professional can have is credibility. And the more that you're aware of the different fraud schemes that are out there, and the more that you're able to explain to your clients ways to protect them, then the better you're gonna be perceived as an agent. So that's the goal here. The second, one of the goals, the second goal really is to minimize your liability, to minimize your exposure to risk so that you don't have to worry about contacting your ENO carrier. You don't have to worry about contacting Philip and spending a lot of time thinking about this major distraction of a possible liability. That results in opportunity loss when you should be 100% focused on the business and improving your relationships with your clients and expanding and scaling your own business. So without further ado, let's go for an outline. You know, in the military, we were always told, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So that's been stuck in my head for the last 20 years or so. And so here we are. And they still don't hear you with, once and they still don't hear you once you go through all that, Griffin. But go ahead. <laughs> uh, fortunately it's being recorded. So once they they don't hear, they can always go back and look at it. Uh, first thing up, we're going to do statistics. Uh, why? Because studies have shown that statistics uh, make presentations more believable and also they make them more memorable, even if people do not remember what the actual statistics are. Next thing we're going to do is we got to set, we got to figure out, get you in the right mindset so that when you get a phone call, when you have an experience with a new individual or a new purported company, that you're able to identify what oddities might exist that make you a little bit suspect of their intentions. So we're gonna look at those red flags there. Next thing is the real meat of it. What are the different scams and the different fraud tactics that are out there that you absolutely positively must know about? And then we're gonna talk about how to protect yourself with, in respect, with, with respect to each one of those different schemes. And again, not all of these schemes are necessarily gonna be title related. We are gonna to touch on wire fraud. We're gonna to touch on other fraudulent activities where the agent is a completely innocent actor, but just gets lumped into an alleged liability. Why? Not because anybody actually believes that the agent did something terribly wrong, but the agent has insurance and the brokerage has insurance. Insurance means deep pockets. Deep pockets mean more likely to get paid. And as we all have probably seen before, cases go to mediation before they go to juries. So it's easy to file a lawsuit. I can file a lawsuit today for $300, take me an hour to draft it. Now somebody gets served and they have to answer and hire a lawyer and it gets very expensive. These things go to mediation and insurance companies oftentimes will get out the checkbook and make somebody go away by simply providing a nuisance payment. Philip, I'm sure you have very strong beliefs on on uh, settling with people who are effectively trying to extort the company when there's not a legitimate basis in law or fact to pursue a claim. As my mother used to say, honey, don't get me started. <laughs> um, we had a big one not long ago that actually was a minor case. It was absolutely a ludicrous claim. The plaintiff still walked away with $50,000 that day, but it would have cost three times that to litigate it. So it was a business decision on the part of the insurance companies. This is real. It happens every day. You better listen to what this man is saying. It's a good point, Philip. It's the mindset shouldn't be I'm safe because I haven't done anything wrong. 
that is the, the wrong way to be framing it. The right way to frame it is by if there is any way for somebody to perceive that you have done something wrong or you have colluded or conspired or conferred with someone who has done something wrong, then you're going to get lumped in. And that's why it's incredibly important to identify the red flags on the front end and know how to protect yourself so that when there is a scope of liability that is drawn by some plaintiff's attorney uh, who just wants to get 40% of whatever can be collected, before that happens, you are already outside the scope of, of concern or scope of risk. And that's what one of the objectives here is today. And I also wanna talk about the consequences of failing to exercise the due diligence that you're required uh, to do as an agent under the appropriate Tennessee statute. And I'm also going to talk about what the proper standard of care is. And Ryan is going to be chiming in quite a bit of, on that one because there's a difference between what's required by the law and, and then what benchmark policy is. Uh, because, you know, the law is just the baseline. That's the default that you have to satisfy. But benchmark goes higher than that to make sure that your standard of care is actually exceeding what's required by law. And then uh, lastly, we're going to have a list of properties that uh, have been the target of attempted fraudulent activity. In some cases, uh, they were spotted by the title company. In other cases, it was spotted by the, the agent. The list is 54, and that 54 absolutely pales in comparison to what is actually out there. Why? Because they don't get reported. Either one, the different title companies that are in the network, they don't report the fraud, uh, or two, it gets resolved at the agent level and never gets to the title company, so we can't put it on our master registry that we're keeping with all the local title companies. So when I say 54 properties, it could be 540 properties. Nobody really knows because you don't know what you don't know. Statistics, uh, 15,000 cases in 2022. Uh, 15,000 cases across the entire uh, United States doesn't seem like that much, but it's not really 15,000. Uh, that's not how you should look at it. Tennessee has pretty high volume. Tennessee is actually on the higher end of the spectrum when it comes to the number of cases reported compared to other parts of the, the country. These fraud statistics, they're not entirely about uh, fake sellers, fake buyers. There's a lot of wire fraud that's into this. There's a lot of uh, fraud that relates to email uh, campaigns to try to get people to rent a certain property and then the recipient of that information just makes the first month payment in order to hold the, the property and the property doesn't actually exist. So these 15,000 cases and then the expected 30,000 in 2023, they are, they are not the only focused on real estate, but I will say that of those 30,000, that um, it's all, always on the rise. And so 15,000 last year, 30,000 this year, there's a reason for these statistics to be doubling. And the FBI has suggested that the reason is because the more technology we get, the more anonymity that people can have, the more confidentiality can people have, the more brazen that they're gonna get. And so it's just technology is advancing and they're using that technology to, to be able to um, sometimes carry out the, these fraudulent acts and maneuvers. Uh, $350 million lost to scammers. And again, that's only the reported cases. That's not an estimated $350 million. That's an actual $350 million was lost last year to scammers. And uh, the amount is much higher for when you consider the cases that weren't reported. If you extrapolate out one for one and assume that 2023 is going to be double what 2022 was, you now have $700 million of law, a potential loss or estimated loss for 2023. The next statistic is a little bit staggering because you might be thinking, well, if there was fraud, then why would commissions be at risk? We're gonna to get to this in a little bit. But if you are part of a real estate transaction that was fraudulent, but that resulted in commissions, then by law, you have been quote, unjustly enriched because that real estate transaction should have never occurred. And the commissions that were earned are now subject to being clawed back either because the court would require it or because it's the best way to avoid being involved in a lawsuit. So the commissions are at risk. It is real. It's not just about being a defendant. It's about actually losing money. And the commissions aren't the extent of the money. You can actually lose more than that, depending upon 
what uh, your involvement was, but certainly if you have to start hiring lawyers, if it's not going to be covered by E and O, if there's a dispute about coverage, then that that commission check is prob probably pales in comparison to what the attorney retainer is. Uh, this next bullet, 23,000 business email compromises. This is definitely on the rise, and it's a, a fairly simple one for people that are a little bit tech savvy to figure out. If you've ever gotten an email from somebody with a signature block, you can get, uh, it's, it's very simple to now take that signature block and create a new email account and put that signature block as your own with just minor modifications to telephone numbers and names. And now once you have that new email address and you have the new signature block, it makes that email a whole heck of a lot more believable when it lands into the inbox of someone who may have been expecting an email from that uh, bank or that other party. Uh, 101 and 121 real, real estate transactions involve fraud or attempted fraud. That's pretty staggering if you think about it. Of course, a lot of these aren't found out at the closing table. A lot of these are found out beforehand, but the different ways that people are getting creative to try and do things that are not only illegal, but just morally corrupt, uh, it never ceases to amaze me. And these people, as you can probably guess, they're not located in Nashville. They might be located in Wisconsin. They might be located in Europe. They might be located in Africa. The beauty of the internet for them is that they can do things outside of the jurisdiction of the United States so that even if the FBI would ever find out exactly who it was, the investigation would stop because there's no way to extradite somebody from these countries or to hail them into United States court. So uh, the reason I mention that is because the fraud attempts that we're going to talk about are extraordinarily low risk endeavors for the people who are committing the fraud. However, it's an extraordinarily high risk transaction for you to be involved in. So that difference in and that, that misalignment uh, is something that has to be important when you go to weigh how to view newcomers. I know we all wanna trust people when they call and that they're up to, they only have good intentions, but unfortunately reality dictates we have to be a little bit more careful. Let me just right, let's, let's, let me let me chime in on a statistic you just stated there. You, you you said one in 121 real estate transactions involve fraud or attempted fraud. Let's boil that down to reality on the local level. We did 10,000 transactions last year in benchmark. If you do the math on that, that means that 85 of those had the potential for fraud. Now we caught several, several we caught. We just don't brag about it. Okay. But this is a real deal. So one in 121, you can say, oh, well, I only do 20 transactions a year. So I've got five years before I have to worry about this. It ain't so. It ain't so. So pay attention, please. Thanks. Even more. You want to boil it down even more. I mean, think just last week we did roughly 200 contracts. So you're talking about one plus a week company wide. So you know, the further you boil it down, just hopefully that nails home how often this is happening. So. Very true, very true. That is, you you nailed it also, Philip, when Benchmark is uncovering these. At first, it seemed like the title companies were the ones that were finding them out. We were going to the agents and saying, hey, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. Can you explain this to us? And then it turns out it's fraudulent. But here in the last couple of months, Benchmark agents have been very impressive with their ability to ferret these people out on the front end and then let us know. Just this week, Holly Andraka, she was able to spot somebody before it ever even got to the point where she was even involved in the representation. And she's not the only one. There's, so I can think of John Brown, I can think of Drew Hendry, Tina Riley, uh, Melissa, Victoria. It, it, the list goes on with people that have contacted us, not really to say anything more than just, hey, we want you to know this is a, a fraudulent activity. They haven't really been coming to us to say, can you help us? because they've already done the work on the front end by educating themselves and being trained. So yes, exactly. But, Team effort all the way. Uh, yeah. The other thing I will tell you that will lend some more credence to the seriousness of this matter is the last one I saw that was successful was a $497,000 transfer. Gone. Never recouped any of the money. So it's real. Go ahead, Griff. Yeah, I... It happens. There's there are lawsuits right now. There are currently lawsuits in multiple counties right now that involve 
agents, brokerages, title companies, and current occupants of properties to divest them of the ownership of that property because it was related to the exact scam that we're going to talk about first. But first of all, you know, there are hallmarks of a scammer. There are there is certain profiling that uh, can be applied to fraudulent activities and scamming efforts. And so this list here is not exclusive, of course. The best red flag that I use in the day-to-day -day practice is talking to somebody when uh, receiving emails, sending emails, and just talking to somebody. You've all been doing this a long time. You're experienced. You, weren't, you wouldn't be in benchmark if you weren't experienced. Trust your gut. Trust your instinct. And uh, you can just get a feel for people. Uh, one of the best attributes to have is being a good reader of people. You can tell by their eyes, you can tell by their voice, you can tell by their mannerisms. Those are more of the subject of things that you just have to have a good judgment and good feel for. But there are some objective things too. The types of properties that are the most highly sought after by fraudsters are those that are not encumbered by a deed of trust and those that are vacant or their rental properties. So those two types of properties, vacant land and rental properties, are certainly at the top of the list, but you, then you distill that even further to say that there's no deed of trust on them, and then uh, it becomes a smaller number of properties, but at the same time, when those, are, are, when those exist, consider that to be the reddest of all red flags. There are a lot of people that travel in this world or that, that li don't live in Nashville and they they say, oh, I, I can't meet you. And that's fine. That happens in life sometimes. If somebody is is taking care of a parent in a different city and they're not going to be back in Nashville, if Nashville isn't their primary residence, they only had investment properties or they only owned property or they got it somehow uh, willed to them at some point, they might not have much of a presence in Nashville. And so, sure, some people aren't able to attend the initial meeting with the real estate agent when they reach out asking to be represented in connection with the real estate transaction. That's not a terribly huge red flag. What is a red flag is if they can't go on video, if they can't hop on a Zoom, if they can't do a FaceTime, that's a huge red flag. These people want to remain anonymous and the last thing they wanna do is put their face out there that can be screenshotted to anybody. They wanna work in the dark and that's something that if they pursue that approach, it should definitely cause you to contact your principal broker immediately. Same thing with closing. These scammers do not want to attend closing. Why? Because they're nervous themselves. A couple, well, one, because they're probably not even in Nashville. Have to, so. it's like uh, two, it's, uh, they don't want to attend the closings because then who knows who's waiting for them. We've had, at our office, we've had, attempted sting operations where we know that a transaction is fraudulent. And so we tip off the local authorities. We schedule a closing time and hope somebody shows up. They don't, unfortunately. I was really hoping I was ready to go that day and was hoping for the best, but unfortunately never showed up. But they don't want to show up there. And they also don't want to show up because then there's an ability for someone to look directly at a driver's license and then marry it up with their face. And if something isn't perfect, that person's face is going to be remembered by everybody who is in that office that day. So bottom line, if somebody wants to use a power of attorney and that connects with the closing or they can't meet in person, they can't do video, all those things are part of the different things that make you, should make you start to wonder or question someone's intentions. Uh, on the seller side, they don't want this property marketed for very long. The longer that the property is marketed, the longer it is that the true owner has an ability to find out or to see that it's being fraudulently listed or to find out about it from a friend who drives by to say, hey, I didn't know you were selling your property or a neighbor to give somebody a call to say, when'd you make this decision? So seller willing to accept less than fair market value, uh, red flag. Same thing with a buyer who's willing to pay more. And this is where the plans have gotten a little bit, a little bit greedy. You know, if there's a property that's worth 400 grand, if you're smart about your scam, you're gonna say, you know, I'll pay 410 for it. But these people are paying, are willing on the buyer side to say, oh, I'll, I'll pay basically whatever number, whatever number it is. And then they um, are hoping to secure a fast deal and gives them a little bit more credibility by having the cash to be able to close or the ability to, to pay a higher amount. We'll get to that one 
here in a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, very quick closing for the same reason we just talked about. Uh, the longer that a property is on the market, the longer that they have to be figured out. Always look at Google. Always go and do a Google search of somebody's phone number. I do it all the time because I get so many spam calls and junk calls. You run it through and it should be something that's a hit if this person has had the, the phone for a while. And if they're legitimate, there should be some ability to even informally trace it back. If not, a little bit of a red flag. And then lastly, not knowledgeable on the property or the neighborhood. This is where I think the benchmark agents have really shined. They um, have that initial intake call with the alleged client or the purported client. And that person wants to sell, for example, vacant land. Well, these people that are doing this, they're not actually ever physically driving by the property. They're using Google Earth. They're using uh, different resources from afar to know which properties to identify. And they have about 100, 150, 200 properties that they're constantly emailing people about and they're constantly trying to make those properties the subject of a fraud scam. Well, when you have that many properties, the sheer volume doesn't al allow these criminals to do 100% due diligence on what that property is. They don't know what's next door. They don't know when they bought the property. They don't know who the lender was on the property. They don't know what the neighborhood looks like. And so on the benchmark side, I think that some of the people I talked about and other agents too, if I forgot somebody, it's certainly not my intention. Um, but they uh, are asking those questions to test the knowledge and you can do it in a way that is seamless. It doesn't have to be, hey, for your security, I need to make sure that you're the accurate uh, owner, the, the actual owner of this property. What does a neighbor's house to your left look like? It's not quite as rigid as that. You can just say, oh, how long have you been in, the, been in, the, in this property? And they'll ask, they'll ask the question, do you know your neighbors pretty well? What's that the house to the, let me see here, the house to the right. I forget which one, who lives there? So you can do it in a little bit of way so that the people don't think on your first phone call that you are being a little bit persistent and nosy. That's one approach to take. The other approach to take is, for people right to get out there and say, there's a lot of fraud that's happening in Nashville. And one of my jobs as an agent is to make sure that you're protected. I don't I only have a, a personal duty to do that, but I have a fiduciary duty to make sure that I'm minimizing your risk during this process. And so for me to be able to do my job and for me to be able to make you feel comfortable that you chose the right agent, I need to ask you a few questions just to make sure that you're the actual owner. I have no doubt that you are, but at the same time, I just wanna make sure that my file is complete to make sure you're protected. You say it like that and all of a sudden people actually appreciate what you're trying to do. And then you don't have to be clandestine about it and sneaky, you can just come right out and say that you're doing it for their protection and that usually they respect it. Let's look at these, these fraud schemes. One, the most common one right now, and you've seen it on the closed group, we gotta talk about it again because we're still getting questions about it all the time. A fraudulent and a fake seller. That's uh, that, uh, that vacant land or that real, uh, that rental property that we're talking about. That is the target here. Also wire fraud. Wire fraud is something that can affect, that will affect the transaction. This isn't one about title, but it's one that you absolutely have to be able to tell your clients about so that they can protect themselves. Banks, signature blocks are forged more than any other signature block in the country. And that's because banks have the money and they are the ones that if someone can, can do a good job of mimicking their emails, then there's a direct correlation between how much money these criminals actually get. Shell buyers. This one is actually becoming big too. It was a little bit bigger last year, but it's still huge out there. And it's one that a lot of agents don't really even think about. And then miscellaneous, you serious lending. Well, how can lending possibly be come be with an agent. And I'll just say four, four letters um, have come to mind, R-E-I-N. Uh, that has been, that group has some uh, lenders that are, have been deemed, not just, this isn't me saying it, a court has deemed that there is a predatory and illegal action uh, that has taken place. So I wanna make sure that to the extent that you work with some of those lenders or they cross your table that you know what to look out for. And lastly, fraudulent disclosures. And we're talking about property disclosures, but it's very easy for a buyer of a property 
to assume that an agent was aware of a misrepresentation contained on a disclosure. And so this is where you have to get really real with your client because you go to your client and say, if you're not accurate on this document, it's not just you, it's gonna be me too because people are gonna assume that I knew. And so I need you to be very careful and very specific about this document here. Let's start with the, the big one here, the one that hopefully everybody's heard of, but I'm assuming that there's a decent subset that has not. Easiest way for me to explain this is by using it as an example. Ryan's gonna be, Ryan's gonna be the actual homeowner in this situation or the, the property owner, and I'm gonna be the criminal. Um, and I've never committed a crime in my entire life, ever, not even, not even speeding. So this is gonna be a little bit unfamiliar to me, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna work through it. Ryan owns property and I see that he owns property and uh, in Davidson County. And I'm obviously criminal and I'm sitting uh, in, a, in some European country picket. And then I look at this, this property and I see that the property is unencumbered uh, because I'm smart enough to do 10 minutes worth of due diligence to figure out what liens might exist on the property. Or if I couldn't do it myself, I call Momentum Title and say, hey, a little bit, I am not if I'm a criminal, but in general, if you have a question about the existence of encumbrances or liens on a property, you can give us a call if you work with us and we certainly talk you through that. But if I'm a criminal, I see that Ryan owns property and it's a vacant property and it's unencumbered because I've done a little bit of research. And when I say a little, I, I literally mean 15 minutes of research. I know that, that Ryan's the owner. So I want to make money off of Ryan and I don't care about Ryan's feelings. I don't care about the consequences to him. And so my next step then is to reach out to an agent and say, I'm interested in selling my property. My property, this is the address. Here's the map. Here's the parcel number. And the reason I'm thinking about selling it is because I just don't need it. I was planning on a long time ago developing this property, but I've moved to Colorado and I just don't think that I have any desire to do anything with this property. I certainly can't rent it out. And so I just want to put it on the market. Um, would you mind just looking at this property and giving me some numbers as to what you think the, the fair market value is and how much I could sell it for? And so, great. The agent's happy to get it and starts to do some due diligence. At the same time, I am now going through the process of paying less than $30 to get both a fake driver's license and a fake notary stamp. When I say fake driver's license, I'm not talking about ones that some people, not me, uh, use in college uh, that wasn't even the same person. I'm talking about a driver's license that I've held them up side by side, Arizona driver's license that's real, Arizona driver's license is fake, and I could not tell the difference, and I was touching them. Cost less than $30. There's actually a place in East Nashville that's been printing these things. And so I order that, and it might be my face. It might not be my face. Probably not because I never want anybody to ever see me in person. So I choose a random face. And if I'm really good, I can actually find the face of the owner of the property if they have a social media presence. It's pretty scary how much you can find on the internet. So after I've gotten my driver's license, I now contact the uh, place that prints notary stamps. And I don't know, they're 12 bucks, I think. Uh, $12 and I say, hi, I'm Chris Corvo, owner of Momentum Title, and I would like a new notary stamp because I lost mine. That comes in the mail a week later. So now I have a driver's license in my hand that is not me, is has the name Ryan Ford on it. And I found pictures in the Nebraska football archives of Ryan's face and I put it on that, that driver's license and it looks real. And I have Chris Corvo's notary stamp. I can do anything that I want at this point with this transaction, but it's gonna take you to be able to spot the different red flags. Because I don't, remember, I don't wanna meet you. Uh, and I'm gonna do my best to make sure that nobody ever sees me. So I have my driver's license. I have my notary stamp. You're going through the process of looking at comps and telling me what I'm gonna be expecting to sell this property for. I then go open a bank account. It's not that hard because I now have a Ryan Ford bank account and I just opened the bank account and I put 10 bucks in it to start it. And I let it sit there. You come back to me as the agent and say, here's what I think I can sell it for, $100,000. 
And you're, if the person is good, they say, well, that's a little bit, you know, that's not quite what I was hoping for, but I was hoping you'd say a lot more than that. But, you know, if it can be a really quick sale, then I'll take that. In fact, I'll even take less if it's going to be a quick sale. Cash buyer, then sure. So then there is at that point, that's when the engagement begins. The agent is now representing a fake seller and lists the property, gets that offer in, takes it to the fake seller and says, well, here you go. You want to accept it? Absolutely. Signs Ryan for his name. It's great because it's going to close in two weeks. So signs the, signs the name and it goes to the title company for processing. So at this point now you have Ryan Ford signing a contract. You have a buyer who has absolutely no idea what's going on, uh, but you have the actual Ryan Ford who's going about his life having no idea what's happening. So buyer and actual owner have no idea what's going, what's happening. You as the agent have no idea what's happening. Only one party knows that this is a fake transaction and it's the, it's the criminal here. So this goes to closing and some title companies would say, oh, you're in Colorado, that's unfortunate, um, but no problem because we can do a power of attorney. We need you to go ahead and, and give, uh, we can either give us, so me, so Griffin Dunham, uh, I'm gonna need you to give me the power of attorney so I can sign the documents on your behalf. And so this person then says, no problem, signs a power of attorney form that the title company provides and it has my name signed by Ryan Ford, given the power of attorney to Griffin Dunham. And it has a notary stamp that's signed by Chris Corvo with his Chris Corvo notary stamp on there. So title company gets it back, thinks everything's good to go, closes the transaction. At the closing, as part of those documents, the fake seller has instructed the proceeds from the sale to be delivered to this fake account. So it closes. The account is the, the account is then populated with the proceeds. Seller immediately sweeps that, that account and is gone, never to be seen again. And now all of a sudden you have a buyer who has bad title to a property. You have a fake seller who now has the proceeds from the sale. And you have Ryan Ford who still has no idea what actually happened to his property. So maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years down the road, Ryan drives by and sees that somebody has started a building on that property, walks up to him and says, what are you doing on my property? Person says, this isn't yours, this is my property. And now is when Ryan figures out what has happened and uh, he handles it calmly, but then proceeds to sue everybody. He sues me as the power of attorney, he sues the title company, he sues the agent, he sues the brokerage, uh, he wants to go after insurance, can't even find the actual fake seller. And 100 days out of 100, that real owner, Ryan Ford, is going to win that lawsuit. He is going to win the lawsuit against the title company because we insure against fraud. He's going to win the lawsuit against the agent to the extent that the agent got commissions, regardless of if he did anything wrong or not. And may win against the brokerage if the agent did not do any reasonable due diligence prior to becoming engaged and listing that property on the MLS. Okay. And so I wanna talk about how to protect yourself and I'm gonna ask Ryan to chime in here because this is where from a compliance standpoint, there's a difference between doing the minimum and doing what you should reasonably do to protect yourself. Can so I make one comment, Griffin? On yes, you're talking about when these closings happen, People say, well, why can't you just go to the bank and get the money back and claim a fraudulent transaction? Because what will happen immediately when those funds hit that bank is it's dispersed among about 40 other banks just instantaneously. You can only move $10,000 in a single transaction outside of the United States. So they will disperse it in 10,000 increments, each to a different bank. And then within three days, disperse it to an overseas bank and then disperse it again. So by the time anybody figures out what's going on, in the example Griffin used, it might be a few weeks after the transaction actually happened, that money is gone and there is no way to claw it back. So it's an important fact to think that if you haven't done your work, if you haven't done your due diligence properly, if you haven't protected yourself properly, you could have a serious liability issue here because there's no way to recoup those funds. 
Yep. And I will say that vacant land, that hypothetical, that is a common scheme. We've seen that over and over again, but it's also the same with rental property. Why? Because rental property owners, they don't go to the property every day. And so if it's going to be a teardown and people don't ever want to see inside, then they don't have to ever come in contact with the tenants. But even if they do want to do a walkthrough, then it's much easier for the agent to say, hey, my, the, the owner of this property, you know, you're a tenant here, the owner of this property is going to be selling it. And so we're just going to be doing some, some showings there. I wanted to make sure you were aware of, of that. And um, it's easy for, to find out that information um, because again, these, these people are just, are just too good. The case that I'm working on right now, it's about a million bucks um, is what the, the alleged damage is because this, this buyer had no idea the seller was located in a foreign country. The owner was located in a foreign country and the, the property was, was sold. The buyers moved in, took everything out of there, just gutted the place. And it wasn't for over a year, year after before the true owner of the property came back to visit uh, Nashville and was tipped off. Um, she was actually tipped off by a, an ex-girlfriend of one of the criminals who was jaded because she wasn't involved in the transaction. Instead, he chose to have a new girlfriend involved in the new transaction in this transaction. So she got upset and informed the actual owner. But again, not just vacant land, also rental property. I want to turn it over to Ryan for a minute about how to protect yourself. You know, I think ideal world, when someone says that they want to list property, you could say, great, I need to see your driver's license. It doesn't happen in practice. I mean, it should happen, but it doesn't happen in practice. I'm going to quickly go through these and turn, turn it over to Ryan for a second. So obviously meet the person. You can also, what we always do is send regular mail to the actual owner of the property because there is an address at this padctn.org. Uh, it's a tax assessor site where uh, we can um, find out what the actual, what, what the, I'm sorry, what the tax address is, at least for Davidson County. You can do it for every, every county though. You find out what the, the address is for tax purposes. You reg, send them a regular mail envelope saying, just to let you know your property is up for sale. Can you please confirm that this is accurate? Otherwise, we are concerned that this might be a fraudulent transaction. Obviously do social media and the Instagram, Facebook. I think we're, we're all pretty good at trying to track people down there, ask, ask to talk to neighbors, and then you can always contact the title company and ask for our registry. Ryan, what do you have to add here? No, I think the biggest thing, and like I said, that usually comes up, um, and again, you had asked me this question earlier, was was making that request for the driver's license or the video call, something to get face-to-face. -face. Um, I hate to, you know, stereotype it, but like you said, too, a lot of a lot of times just as you talk to people, you we can understand through conversation um, whether somebody you know, is legitimate or not. And just, and just their choice of words a lot of times too. Um, I personally have had those phone calls and text. Um, I have one sitting on my phone right now where somebody is, uh, Hey, I found you on realtor.com. Are you still an agent? Um, I'm interested in buying a property. And I hate to always be so pessimistic to think that when things just fall in my lap, whether it's not a referral from somebody or something along those other lines, if it's too good to be true, then it usually is. So those things are always just kind of make the hair on my neck stick up, always as a red flag to, to think about. Um, and again, so a lot of it is just being conscious that um, we that this is common enough practice happening in our world that um, we need to unfortunately be a little more, um, I would say standoffish, but assuming uh, sometimes the worst rather than always the best in people, so. Ryan, you were, uh, sorry, Griffin, you were talking about a tax assessor's website that attorneys have access to. And every licensee in the state of Tennessee, or in benchmark anyway, has access to the CRS tax system on real tracks. And it has the tax data there and the address. And what we've been recommending is that you send a registered letter to that address and wait for a response before you move forward on anything else. And we have in several occasions caught fraudulent situations because that seller immediately called that agent and said, whoa, I didn't put my property on, on the market. I'm not even thinking about it. And it was because our agent had the fortitude to send that registered letter. Now you can send a snail mail letter, but you don't know if they got it. 
registered letter or FedEx envelope, you do. And it's, and it's like two bucks, three bucks, four bucks, whatever it is, it's money well spent to cover your downside. 100%. There's no way that a scammer can get away from the address that's being registered with the taxing authority. That'd be a really complex scam for them to update that. Wire fraud. Uh, Ryan's going to talk about this one too, but wire fraud is really common. It still is common. It's uh, it, it can be sometimes. Uh, we're, Ryan's going to talk about the bank side of it maybe a little bit. And I'm just going to talk about the actual wire fraud that we see. Um, it's very simple. Maybe complex to actually carry out, but it's simple in concept. That's it. Um, there's a hack into a title company website. Um, I'm sorry. And the title company email. And that um, enables then the, the criminal to know what the, obviously what the email address is, knows what the signature block looks like, and then can do a search for different files. And so if there's a closing coming up, it's not that hard to find. You can then do a search within that inbox of that, um, that transaction, that property, that closing, and it's gonna then populate some of the documents. It's gonna populate some of the, the, the different uh, parties who are involved in the transaction. Well, then it's pretty simple. Once they get the attachments that are included in the email, or if they can even go more in depth and actually hack into their system, which I'd be scared to, we, we pay a ridiculous amount of money for IT security, more than so much so that I think there has to be something else out there, but that's what you, you just have to do as a cost of business. Because if you don't, these people can get into not only the email, but also the entire system. So once I know that somebody is with a certain title company, I create a new email address that looks almost identical, except maybe at the very end, it has TN or it has the Momentum Title Company. Things that just make it such that the recipient of the email can't easily distinguish between the legitimate one and the illegitimate one. So once that, that email is known and it's able to be duplicated, then the scammer who has now access to who the buyer is in this transaction sends an email with a new attachment, new wiring instructions with that address that's very close with the same name as the person who they've been conferring with the entire closing process. The difference is there's a different phone number. And so that phone number is easy to change and there's a different email address, but it looks identical. So nobody's really going to figure it out. They send that email to the uh, buyer, oftentimes very close to the closing date and say, hey, our wiring instructions have changed. Here's the new wiring, here are the new wiring instructions. Please initiate that at your soonest convenience. And uh, you would be surprised how many people fall for that. Uh, because again, it looks legitimate. Uh, we had one happen uh, where we were able to get it back, but and someone didn't compromise our system, but we had sent an email to another title company. And so that other title company got hacked and therefore that person had access to virtually every title company, um, their signature block in the, entire, in the entire city. So we have to change signature blocks now and do all things that are different. But regardless, it happens. People do fall for this quite a bit. Um, and then the buyer just, you know, sends the, the money to the, the fraudulent account. And then once that happens, it's gone. There's nothing anybody can do. You can't get back the, the wire. It is just gone uh, unless you can act super fast before it gets transmitted. But Ryan, what do you have to add here? Now that's, I mean, like, so we've, we've all been kind of privy to this well over two years now, obviously to the point that, you know, we've updated Tennessee's updated forms, just pointing out how commonplace this is and to be on the lookout for it. And, you know, as a compliance process, we have uh, this completed with every file to make sure that you're going over it with a client to help cut down on um, some of our um, risk exposure. However, just having the document signed ultimately isn't a get out of jail free card, as we all know. So um, again, like you said, being aware of the actual kind of practice and what they're trying to do. And again, making sure that we're communicating that clearly to our clients and, and that all parties are working on the same kind of premise and, and page as to how to verify and calling the title company to confirm before any money's sent and those kind of things to help uh, prevent those things from happening. So 
Shell buyers is the next type of scam. That's where this is on the buyer side. So buyers and LLC, buyers corporation, cost a couple hundred dollars to form a company in Tennessee. You can do it online and you can do it within 10 minutes. So I've created a new company that sounds very successful. Um, and so once I created this LLC and this LLC has no assets, just by virtue of creating a company doesn't create assets. And so I now have a company and I can contact you as a buyer and say, I want to buy this property and this is what I'm willing to do, go under contract the entire time. I am thinking to myself, I have no interest in buying this property uh, because I can't, I don't have the ability to do it. I have a couple thousand dollars that I'm willing to put forward towards earnest money. But the way that I'm going to make money off this transaction is by flipping the contract or by doing a double close. And so we go through, we go under contract. I then start looking at my network as a, this, as a shell buyer with the company. I go through and I'm trying to find somebody. I can't find anybody. And so as a result, the, on the day of closing, I just don't show up. I don't contact you. I'm gone. I'm dead uh, to the world. And so sellers call and say, I want to sue them immediately. I want to sue right now because this person didn't close. And so we get involved and say, well, this company was formed two months ago. We see that they have purchased no other property. They have sold no other property. And so at this point, it looks as though someone just created a, an LLC with no assets just to go under contract so that they knew that their minimum, their maximum exposure was going to be equal to the earnest money. So if they send out $2,000 of earnest money 25 times and that results in $50,000, well, that's only one deal from a profit standpoint. So they're willing to sometimes pay that earnest money and possibly lose it just for the ability to get that one sweetheart deal. But don't even think that they're just gonna give up on the earnest money. You have to have consent from both parties to release it because the laws have changed now so that notwithstanding the terms of the contract, title companies are really not able to disperse funds if there is any dispute at all. That then fake buyer says, no, nah, I have a dispute. I think that the reason that I didn't close was fill in the bogus reason. Then there's a dispute, he ends up getting half of it back. And so it's not even a completely, um, risk it's close sometimes to a risk-free transaction to these buyers but really their only real risk is earnest money why if you sell the company there are no assets the individual didn't even sign the contract um, should have if there's a corporation as a buyer or a corporation as a seller the corporation doesn't sign its name in cursive we've seen that the individual who is the authorized party on behalf of the company who is an acting agent signs individually so in these cases with these shell buyers you either one have a fake name or two you have on the contract the name of the company written down there and so i think that the way to protect yourself for these both sides now keep in mind that if you are i, I say this because if you are on a buyer's agent you want to know that this company might not be legitimate you're going to do some work and not having the show for it same thing on the seller side, and even more important on the seller side, if an LLC is buying a, uh, a piece of property as an agent, be hyper-focused on making sure that this buyer can show proof of funds, making sure that they're legitimate. You can do your own research. Again, it takes three minutes by going to the Secretary of State website. I actually have it as a bookmark on my browser. So I click on it and I can, I can find out the exact formation date of the company. If it was two weeks before the offer was made, be suspicious. They haven't had time to accrue assets. If they don't have any other real estate holdings, it's another indication that it's just a shell company. And so at that point, if you're on the seller side, you go to your client and say, look, we have this offer. It's a good offer, but I don't know about the buyer. I don't, I can't, it's a private company. So I can't figure out what their assets are. And so they were just recently formed. It's unlikely they have any assets because there's no other real estate holding uh, within the Middle Tennessee area. I think we need to ask for a decent amount of earnest money for one and two, I do think that we have to make sure that there are proof of funds available. And so those are the ways to protect your client. And that way, if this turns out to be a fraudulent buyer, then not only does the seller have a little bit more earnest money, but the seller is looking at you saying, thanks for thinking that through. Whereas juxtapose that with an agent who doesn't say anything, once this 
seller gets the advice of an attorney that it would not be a good use of money to pursue an assetless company, then they turn to the agent and say, why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you think through the possibility that this buyer was completely fake and just was formed and doesn't have any assets? You need to do better. And so doing this as a way to protect yourself, I always ask for the operating agreements for, for companies to make sure I know who's signing and also to look at the different uh, dates and to compare signatures. You don't have to. I think that's a little bit beyond what an agent should do, but just make sure when you talk to your title company that they're going through the steps of getting the operating agreement to make sure that there are the right authorities, getting the proper resolutions in place, checking IDs. And so I think that demanding those proof of funds is the last step in there. Ryan, anything to add there? Yeah. One of the other ways that we've seen uh, in the past come up and, and it maybe didn't always doesn't always happen with this, but sometimes obviously these companies will, um, you know, these LLCs or some of these people will, will say, Hey, we've got a fast closing and, and, you know, Hey, the earnest money will be, you know, is due or within a period of time that, you know, the closing is within a week. And so they'll say, okay, well, I'll send a check. They send a check and it gets to maybe the title company or the brokerage or whoever's holding it. And, and then ultimately the, let me say the deal doesn't fall apart, but during their due diligence, they say, oh, well, the deals died. So send me my money back. If, if you don't have a company that you're working with, that is smart enough to basically not issue money back to a party prior to those funds being cleared, then sometimes they're sending, whether it be a fraudulent check or there's, the, you know, it's not real money, hoping that you send them legitimate money back and then they're gone on to the next. Right. So sometimes it's a uh, it's a earnest money play and the shell is, is just that it's just a shell just so they can do it under a different name for added protection. So. Other fraud schemes, uh, you serious lending is real, uh, but nobody knows that it's real and nobody's doing anything bad intentionally. If um, there are several private lenders, and I, if I hear if I hear the terms private money guy, private money lender any more than I'm, I'm unfortunately, I think gonna have to get, get committed. Uh, most of these people are, a lot of these people are, are not legitimate. They don't use legitimate forms. They don't know what they're talking about. They just have a little bit of money and they're hoping to have a high origination fee and a high interest rate because someone's not credit worthy enough to go through a regular financial institution or they're really benefiting from uh, someone's need for, for a quick close on the, on the loan and they capitalize by having a lot of expenses and fees that are usurious. There are several lawsuits that are pending right now. I'm not gonna go into who the defendants are, even though they're public knowledge, but you can certainly reach out. Uh, but the interest rates are usurious. And that means that the quote lender has to not only give back the amounts above and beyond the usury rate, they have to give back all of the interest that they ever received in connection with that loan. And there's an argument that they can't recover at all if it's a RICO violation, meaning that it is a violation of these, I don't wanna call them corruption. I mean, it sounds bad when you say corruption, but if it's a concerted activity that's part of your regular course of business, then uh, that's something that can result in huge penalties. The reason I bring it up here is because to you, you have no idea if this lender is that this lender is breaking the law. And the lender probably doesn't either. They're using the same loan documents and the same process as they recycle them within the group. But if you are always using the same lender, we're seeing agents get sued because there's an assumption that there is corrupt concerted activity between the lender and the agent. And it's probably not true at all. It just so happens that because of the frequency that you deal with this lender, it, it puts you under the microscope. And so people would assume that obviously this lender and the agent are working together. You get lumped into a lawsuit and you don't even understand what the usury laws are. Not fair, but it happens. Fraudulent disclosures, again, this one is, is pretty simple. Your people have to tell the truth on the disclosure statement. We're seeing agents who are getting sued because of the assumption that they know the property condition. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the amount of time they spend in it, because of the their their proximity to the neighborhood that they happen to to live in, this one's hard because you have to just make sure that your people are being honest. But at the same time, just don't always take the word for it. Do a little bit of diligence to make sure that what the, they're putting on the disclosure is accurate. And also read the disclosure. 
A lot of people don't actually read the disclosure. I think every one of those lawsuits that we've ever had, we've had 15 lawsuits in 17 years. So that's a pretty good track record. But every one of them included fraudulent disclosure by the agent. Every one of them. Mm. So it, it's a fact. It's real. It's easy. It's low hanging fruit. And from a lawyer's perspective, it's one that can't get kicked out on a motion to dismiss. So you're guaranteed to be in a protracted legal battle, which means legal expenses. And that increases the risk of a quick settlement. Uh, deed stealing, this is simple. You just forge a deed and then you use that to get a loan and then you take the money and run and you don't care about the existence of it. One thing I'll say about this title lock, we've all heard about it. People ask about it all the time. Title lock is not a fraud prevention system. It's a noticing system. And so all it does is tell people once somebody else has already committed fraud on their property, it doesn't do anything beneficial. Forbes even said it's a waste of money. So tell your people not to get title lock. It doesn't do them any good. You can actually register with each county, almost all counties um, online, not all, all the big ones. Uh, you can get that online. So you get noticed whenever there is a change in the registered deeds properties. Uh, consequences of fraud, this is pretty easy. Uh, financial losses, of course, people are going to lose money. Your clients, your buyers are going to lose money. They fall subject to, to this scam. So go ahead and on the front of them and say, make sure you check your email addresses. Make sure you check your signature boxes. boxes. Make sure you call people before you ever wire anything. Don't just trust an account. Always call and ask them to verify the last four. So that's you can prevent those financial losses to your client and to yourself. Uh, you have to contact your E&O coverage. That's embarrassing. That's difficult. You have to contact Philip Cantrell, which is a hell of a lot scarier than contacting your your E&O carrier. Heck, uh, Good point. I I, Good point, Griff. <laughs> yeah, you had to. If you told me to, to choose between contacting my E&O carrier or Philip, I'd be like, look, I'll, I'll talk to the insurance people all day. Uh, and then there's going to be a lawsuit naming title companies, brokerages, agents, and then even the good faith, the bona fide purchasers. Because if you buy a property where the seller didn't actually authorize the sale, you don't just get to keep the property and pay the, the seller. No, you get you move out. You get divested of your ownership interest. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter if you've had if you put your three kids into that, that property and you've made it your own. You're coming out of that property and it's going back to the original owner. And then judgments. Commissions are going to be at risk. I say at risk. It's basically a certainty that if you were involved in a fraudulent transaction and got commissions, you're going to lose those. Uh, I, will, I am going to post, this is the last slide, I'm going to post the, on the, uh, in the closed group the list that the local title companies have put together where we know that these, pro these properties are fraudulent. This isn't all of them. Again, there are a lot that never get reported to title companies, so this is not exclusive, but always for vacant properties, for rental properties, bounce, this, bounce that property off of this list that I'm going to post and um, make sure that it's not already on the list because even though it, if it happened once, that means that the person sent it out to 15 different agents. We had, I think, nine agents trying to sell the same property one time. And Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, I think you have one minute left. So Good deal, Sorry. awesome. Let's see here. Griff, you'll need to stop sharing so he can share his, I believe. There you go. All right. So just, well, Ryan's getting ready, just so everybody knows. Um, I'm really not that bad of a guy to talk to on the phone, but I'm going to ask you, why'd you do something stupid? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't get upset with me. Uh, we'll have a serious conversation. We have your back at Benchmark. That's one of the things that we do. I'm bringing Ryan into these conversations as well when we have a compliance issue or when we have a lawsuit issue or whatever it is. I always make sure that Ryan's involved with it. And if we need to, we get Griffin. But the, um, the insurance companies have some, you can go ahead with your screen share there, Ryan, if you want to. The insurance companies have some uh, really good attorneys, and we have uh, a couple here in Middle Tennessee that know our systems, that know what we do and how we do it. So it's it's a fairly smooth process. Now, if there's a question, uh, well, whether there's a question or not, you'll always need to also reach out to your insurance company uh, as soon as you get a claim filed and immediately contact your principal broker if that happens. So go ahead, Ryan. Good deal. Well, since we're, we're kind of on the topic again about scams and things that ultimately can kind of affect closings, 
Um, this is one we wanted to bring to your attention. We've done it before too. And, and I do want to preface this, but this is not necessarily a scam, but just something that again is, is happening in our current marketplace that is affecting certain closings from going through. Um, so this is a company that is based out of Florida that is a legitimate brokerage and they have a license here in the state of Tennessee as well as operating in 33 states, which is MV Realty. And back in 2018, they started offering a, uh, a program which they call their homeowner benefit program. And basically the summary of this program was that they were, uh, they were giving people cash between $300 to $5,000 um, if they were in need of cash for whatever reason, no, basically no uh, loan. It wasn't a loan, but they were saying, hey, I'm short on cash. I need something quickly. I have a house. I will enter into a 40-year listing agreement with you to sell my home in uh, basically for the $300 to $500,000 in cash. Now, when this practice happened, the first state that started uh, basically looking into this was Florida. They filed a suit. Uh, claiming that this company was operating and filing or alleged deceptive practices. And then shortly thereafter, multiple states opened their own investigations. Uh, the attorney generals of these states are getting involved, everything from uh, North Carolina. And then other states have actually even gone further in the practice uh, and have, so Pennsylvania, as an example, filed their suit and they were alleging that this practice was ultimately targeting elderly and financially vulnerable individuals. Okay, uh, along those same lines, Massachusetts uh, filed their suit by the AG in, two in 2022, Ohio in February of this year, and then in certain states like with uh, uh, Washington State is actually making headway with their state legislation to restrict the these long term agreements. So actually putting a cap in place. That uh, a list uh, that a brokerage is able to have somebody under a listing agreement. So, um, just kind of want to bring that to everybody's attention because there have been there have been closings that have not occurred here locally because one of the other practices that they do when they give that money up front is they file a memorandum in the county. They call it a memorandum. It's ultimately a lien against the property, right? And so. Unless that lien is cleared, then the title cannot transfer. They cannot give clear title. Um, so that is what is holding up some of these transactions. And again, when some of the states are claiming that it's the they're targeting elderly and financially vulnerable, um, again, that's kind of always the the easy keyword of saying people who are not reading the details, not really knowing what they're signing up for on the on the front end. They just see, hey, you're willing to give me cash, great. Okay, and then they sign over their rights per se. So some of the other terms and some of the other details of that is even if the people decide to list and sell the home with somebody else, they still, this company, MV Realty, is still due the commission, right? It's just like any typical listing agreement. You have a listing agreement in place, they sell with somebody else, you still have rights to that compensation. So again, some of the things that you could be uh, I would say weary of or be looking out for in those situations is if, again, if you have a uh, a client that, again, not saying is just necessarily elderly, but um, doesn't necessarily remember everything they've done with the property, right? Something that you may want to do is reach out to the title company and request that there be a title search ran on the forefront to make sure there's no other liens in place or something that you're just not aware of that could ultimately cloud the title and prevent the the closing from happening. Now there's a response back in February of 2023 from MV Realty as all these lawsuits and injunctions were happening uh, across the state. They actually came out and said that they have now currently paused entering into any new agreements in all the states that they're operating in. And they're bringing in counsel to help reevaluate and redraft their uh, their agreement to provide more transparency. So all that to say is this company is not saying we're going to stop this practice wholly. And, and you know, basically the lawsuits have made it clear that what we're doing is uh, unlawful. They're basically saying we're going to find a better way of, of continuing to offer this as an option for uh, consumers. So again, make sure that as you're having conversations with your clients uh, that we're digging in and asking those questions, whether they whether they've entered any other agreements with people in the past or put their house up for collateral, whether it be with a bank, a financial institution, or maybe a company such as this.
Now, one a lot of this, a lot of the kind of conversations we've been having today has been focused on um, our clients and people that we're involved with as an agent who is basically the kind of the target for these fraudulent activities, these scams. But it's not solely just our clients, it's actually us as agents as well. If you've been paying attention to the uh, closed Facebook group just this week, literally two days ago, one of our agents, Mitzi Matlock, who I'm sure she's fine with, you know, kind of me saying this and including it here in the presentation as she put it up on our Facebook was was actually the um, the victim more or less of one of these kind of phishing email copycat uh, scams. So in short, somebody had sent an email initially to Philip um, looking like it was from Mitzi saying, hey, I've got a new account that I want all my commission checks um, sent to when, when everything when I have a closing. Can you please update the records accordingly? So Philip sends it on to the office manager as that's the person who's supposed to kind of handle that transaction in that process. And it was caught and said, hey, let's reach out to Mitzi and make sure that this is intended only to find out that obviously it was somebody else sending it and not actually her. And so, again, just make sure um, that you're aware. Again, if you're getting notice from somebody saying, hey, you know, did you send me this email to be on the lookout and take it seriously? Because, again, your email as well could very easily be getting copied and somebody send the stuff on your behalf as well. And then lastly, we kind of talked about it, uh, you know, and Griffin really touched on it, but we really kind of want to go over again the rental scams. It's very similar to the land scams in which somebody is typically hijacking a very uh, a legitimate listing. And whether that's a property that is currently for rent, maybe it is only listed for rent on one or two websites, um, maybe the big ones, but then they're copying that listing and then going to I mean, the dark corners of the web, or maybe even just as something, uh, another directory website and listing that with the only information changed is the contact information of the individual that you need to get in touch with if you have questions and um, that, you know, basically posing as the, the landlord or the owner of that listing. The other would be phantom ads, which is just completely made up listings altogether whether somebody takes a, an old listing and pictures of uh, an entirely different property, uh, an address that doesn't even exist and puts it up on these rental websites. Um, and usually a lot of times they involve low rents or low rents in, uh, with nice amenities. And the telltale sign is they typically always are asking for wired funds. Uh, the same reason is they claim they're out of state, they're out of the country, they're unable to meet them to show them the property. Um, a lot of times we've seen that they'll take a an actual legitimate listing that is a property that's for sale that's vacant, and they will be offering that for rent. And they'll even communicate to the point of saying, "Hey, as, as you know, the house is going to be open on Sunday. Um, I haven't told the listing agent that I'm potentially renting it out as well, so don't say anything to them about you know the rent rates or ask them about that because I, I you know they're not dealing with that aspect of the uh, whether I rent it out or not." And so just uh, go take a look at it. If you like it, then, you know, we'll go from there and uh, we can coordinate, you know, making the lease application and sending the first month's rent and all that stuff. So the, the links they're going to kind of cover their tracks and, and make sure that you can actually get in and see the home and all those things is, is quite extensive sometimes. So that is all that I had in addition to all that great information that uh, Griffin has gone over. Hey, Ryan, if I can just add, Chris actually just forwarded me an email where TLTA just told us that uh, they have passed unanimously in the House and the Senate a bill that will prevent the MV Realty service agreements from ever existing. The yeah. only question is whether or not it's it's retroactive in effect to nullify all the ones that are currently in existence. So big development with Tennessee legislature. Good enough. Yeah, and that's one thing, uh, and it's good because I when I had thought about it from my standpoint was, you know, in Tennessee, we obviously have rules against uh, when it comes to gifts and prizes, as far as you cannot have cash, basically give cash as a gift or an inducement to do business. And so, you know, really that agreement as it is, is, hey, we'll give you cash money in order to sign a listing agreement is the sheer, you know, definition of a cash inducement, which is not applicable or not allowable within the state. So. I'm glad that's already kind of made its way through. And that was my understanding as to, you know, why it's not acceptable here. So. Interesting times, y'all. Interesting times. Um, 
to be clear, uh, so that everybody doesn't go into a tailspin panic here, um, we are trying to educate you so that you are aware of what's going on in the marketplace and can develop some mental defensive barriers against it. The last thing we want to imply is that by walking down the street, you're going to get in trouble. That's not the case. But you have to be careful that you don't step on the landmines or the potholes. Um, a lot of what we've talked about is dealt with identity, your identity floating around on the web and how do they find me? How do they know who I am? How do they know what company I'm with? Well, we are marketers, right? So our information as marketers is out there. And if your information is out there, as I posted in the comments, uh, the, the web spiders, the algorithms that will call, crawl a website and, and glean contact information, they crawl every website on the internet. We have to be out there. We don't have any choice. We have to sell these properties. So walk with your head held high, but also be aware that there are people lurking in the dark corners of your business, of our business. So again, don't operate from a paradigm of fear, operate from a paradigm of awareness. That's what we're saying here in this whole conversation. Um, thank you, gentlemen, Griffin, Ryan. I really appreciate you stepping in here. This is an excellent conversation today. We will be releasing this on the benchmark dash in a little while, as soon as we have all of our stuff together. And we probably will be putting it on the closed group as well. Um, but if you don't see it anywhere, feel free to drop me an email. You see my email there on the screen, and I'm happy to communicate and, uh, and transmit the information to you. Uh, also, we're looking for your comments, your suggestions, your input. Help us get better. Help us help you get better by uh, bringing quality, substantive uh, information discussion to these talks at the last Friday of each month at 9 a.m. You can tune in, and it's open to everyone. So invite your friends. So they can see the cool stuff we're doing over here at Benchmark as well. Um, be sure and look for the survey in your inbox next week about our events. We want to know from you what you want. And if you don't speak up, we can't deliver what you want. So please do that. All right. So with that said, I think we're about done here. And uh, I want to appreciate everybody for attending today. If you think I can do to help you, feel free to reach out to me again, Griffin and Ryan. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great day.